a mess. Um, so my idea is that what I wrote down was uh, a few things. Everything, everywhere, anytime, anyway. Perfect. Thanks I, a lot. I, I like this. I like this. This could be a, a thing I may trademark. Everything, everywhere, anytime, anyway. You, can, you should be able to get everything, every piece of music, every book, every film, <laughs> every video, in every, at every time with your ability to modify it. To, to combine it, to do all kinds of things without digital rights management. I mean, it, it's pretty much almost here as it is. Um, our world is being kind of foolishly changed by the right outsiders. Um, I think that it, it took someone from Apple, Apple computers, to do music right, to fix music, is how music was going to evolve in modern times, post-1998. Um, the, so computer people are fixing a lot of music things for us. The phone company delivers television, Verizon and others. A search engine now is going to provide the best telephone, and that's Google. It's the Android. It's coming October 22nd. I'm glad I didn't buy the iPhone yet. I'm leaning towards mm -hmm. this thing. Um, so I, I, those kinds of things, I think, are, are really important. Um, the idea of music on the Internet we're thinking we're putting music, we're putting these things on the internet, when in fact maybe we should just think it's the internet. How do those things adapt? We often don't think this way. Um, so I'm, I'm leaning, uh, I'm, I'm excited about the things that have come, that are here, the threats. Yesterday was a big day in the music industry, a huge day, which most of went unnoticed, except that there was a big agreement between uh, DEMA, the Digital Media Association, uh, NAM, the retailers, uh, uh, NA, uh, the National Association of Music Publishers, the National Songwriters Association International, the Songwriters Guild of America, all these people finally came to an agreement on how things are going to proceed in terms, of, uh, in terms of some of the ways we deliver and receive music. Uh, that's, that's a big step. Um, so I think that would mean innovation is more likely to happen especially when you have the RIAA saying things that are wiser than how they're acting. Uh, suing customers is just plain foolish, and, and it's a lost cause. Um, so anyway, I'm excited by the changes that are coming and who's on what side and, and how we as musicians have to deal with it. If we think, as, as college professors, I'm just an old professor. I've been, doing, I've been teaching college since 1976. I like theory. I do all that stuff. But if we're not uh, dealing with things at this moment and you know, doing uh, the, the Ning Network, podcasting, blogs, communicating with our students that way, I finally reluctantly accepted Blackboard. I can't stand it, but I do it. <laughs> Uh, it is grading. It will be grading one of my tests today at 5 p.m. Um, you know, if we don't adapt to these things, we're, we're going to be left behind. And, and there's so much there that can help us as faculty. I'm very excited by that. I'll stop at this point because I'll have things to say later, I'm sure. Okay. Paul, you want to take this next? Repeat the question. <laughs> Gaze into the crystal ball. What do you see? First of all, welcome. To Atlanta. Um, are many of you going to the concert tomorrow night, I hope? Some of you, just be polite and raise your hand. It's great. It's the South. Yes, excellent. Thank you. You know what I see? Taylor made a... Where'd he go? He's left. That's He's all right. Taylor. There. I think Taylor made a very good point, which I see. I've been doing orchestra work for about 25 years, so like you, I've been in my little world for a while. Um, I see orchestras much different in 15 years than they are today. I've worked for museum orchestras. I've worked for entrepreneurial orchestras. The way Atlanta as a potential model for a new century is going forward is very intriguing. We don't perceive ourselves merely as a symphonic orchestra. We perceive ourselves as the broker of music and edu music education centered in, in our campus. And, and you say, well, what's the difference? The difference is, is that we can record, we can tour, we can broadcast, we can own and operate two different amphitheaters, we can do a complete student musician high-end training program, we can broker popular music, we are the 15th largest presenter of popular music in the world. When we opened our new amphitheater this summer, the Eagle, we opened it with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra Chorus, Youth Orchestra, two high school marching bands, the next four nights were the Eagles. We can be all those things because we perceive ourselves to be about music management, 
at, who, at its core, we hope is a really, really great orchestra. Tomorrow night's Robert Spano and Maniacs, great program, very serious. Probably on this weekend is Duran Duran at the Amphitheater. It's that kind of blending of things. I see orchestras taking much more seriously their civic responsibility. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that mid-tier, whatever the phrase you use, or mid-sized American cities have a right to an orchestra. I think it's tragic what's happened in Savannah, but having worked with the New Orleans Philharmonic and the Buffalo Philharmonic, as they have come back from the ashes now in Louisiana, it's a great encouragement, but they've come back with a much different approach philosophy, engagement with the community. So that's what I see happening in our industry from my little vantage point. It, it, w being a museum orchestra is great in a few cities. I don't think that's going to be um, workable in most cities. Wow. Thanks, Paul. Kim. Well, I'll take just a little different tact and build on something that Taylor said. I think the demand for music, all kinds of music, is going to do nothing but increase. So I think the potential is there. And when I gaze into the crystal ball, and I've seen a, more of that in the last day in talking to some of the folks who are here, and I think this will happen, um, I wanted to mention something about performer engagement and getting our students to think about engaging an audience. I teach primarily on the pop music side of the music industry. And my students in those fields, it's so natural for them to engage an audience. And when, they, when their bands go out and play on Friday night, they want to reach the audience. They want to interact with the audience. They talk to the audience. Uh, they really bring them in. And I'm starting to see on the classical music side of things that is starting to happen. And I think that is going to be one of the big keys for us to grow our audience. I think we can do much better than 3%. I think maybe we have, uh, and that's certainly changing. But I think we as performers need to work with our students through things like what Taylor is doing and other programs to really convince them that people could stay home and listen to a CD if they want to hear perfect music. The reason they come out to live performances and support live music is that they want that concert experience and they want that engagement with the performer that's on the stage. So I think we're starting to move in that direction. I hope we will continue. I do believe we, it, that will happen and I think it's going to only bode positive outcomes for our uh, classical music. Great. Um, I think I want to just try to link a little bit more to um, Taylor's opening and maybe ask you guys now for a round of comments and then maybe we can open this up to the room. But I'm wondering what any of you think of as the major issues that you would want a dean or a chair of a music unit to focus on when they're thinking about the future. I mean, as a, as a way, you know, what, what's, the, what's the elephant in the room that we're not paying attention to, or what, what's a way of thinking about this that you wish there were more focus on? Is that too broad? No. Anybody want to? Oh. Well, um, I don't know. Flexibility. I like the idea of a dean who's flexible. Um, <laughs> can make changes and adjust. Um, <laughs> and, and, and not have that much fear. I know there's the NASM thing that hangs over, and there's accrediting, and there's, there are all these things like this, but um, just too often people are just frightened of, of, of changes. Uh, I was one who was, you know, my, I learned music by learning, by seeing the Beatles. And I, when I was learning that stuff, when I found out what 4-3 suspension was, and <laughs> In second inversion, second inversion chords meant uh, Brian Wilson, it meant James Jamerson of Motown, 4-3 was Chicago, Chicago Transit Authority, that horn band. I mean, I always think that you should learn music by what you came with. And I, so often people want to, uh, I'm at a school now that's heavy in jazz. They're, they're best jazz school I've ever seen. They're incredible. Um, but I also see the closed-mindedness among it, like, oh no, that's too... I mean, I know people who proudly say, I stopped listening to Miles Davis at Bitches Brew. 
you know, 1969. And there's a lot of that. And, and, but I see that too often with uh, the higher up, with administration, faculty, and sadly among 18-year-old students. So I just think the idea that you've got to be able to change and not worry about these things, to know that it's all going to be uh, what you're talking about, the musical experience of Atlanta providing the Atlanta Symphony the, with all the popular music as well as the great classical. That, if that stuff doesn't exist, and we don't really take advantage of, of the fun bells and whistles and new means of delivering things, I think we're in trouble. So I, I want to see, and I, I'm fortunate, I do get this where I am now, um, great support from administrators and lack of fear. But I've, I've too often seen those problems. Yeah. That's a good one. OK, this would be a big one. Um, ignorance. I have no idea what a dean does. I have a good suspicion what a dean does, but our communities are raising up leaders who are ignorant. And this is not good for art, probably at any level. It's certainly not good for classical art. There's a reason why high classical arts don't flourish some places. There's a reason why they do other places. Um, I would love to figure out how from a higher education standpoint through the office of the dean that we could generate more culturally astute citizens. Lofty ambition, huh? This is what I battle every day. I, I, if I find a handful of people who have any idea what I'm talking about, I'm happy for months. <laughs> and, and, and I've been doing this long enough to be really cynical, and I travel enough in the country and speak enough orchestras usually to be profoundly cynical. But there are some bright, bright spots in our world, but wow, cultural ignorance. It's really tough. There's more, there's only, no, this is terrible, but there, there's, a reason why, uh, there's a reason why high school band programs get funded in Georgia. You know why? Marching band. Football, yeah, uh, 46th. We graduate, Detroit Public Schools, where they graduate, 20%. I don't know what it is. It's, I'm exaggerating, I'm sure. But we should be really, really concerned about those kind of numbers. I am, because I know as I look, future performers, future audience, for future people making philanthropic choices, it's just, they're just, the pipeline is, is getting thinner and thinner even though I agree with Taylor, the, the, the existence of music is, is accelerating, which is great, but the challenge of fighting through the things that are really gonna stand the test of time. I love popular music as much as the next person, but there's a reason why some things are called classics. Uh, and, and so that, I don't know how you combat ignorance, but whoever wants to take that on as the dean, send me a paper. <laughs> Awfully heavy, Paul. Oh, peace in the Middle East, too. Did I add that? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he got you all laughing before I get to make it. Come. Yeah. Um, I would say what I would love to see, and Taylor did hit on this, is that we redefine success for our performance majors. Um, I teach an entrepreneurship for musicians class, and a lot of them come in and they think either they're going to have a full time symphony job and do nothing else or they're unsuccessful. And they would tell people they have not made it in the world. And so we talk in class about multiple revenue streams when I try to get a little business lingo in there and hope, hope they'll survive it. But convincing our students that there are other attainable goals other than that full-time, nothing else but playing in the symphony orchestra job uh, I think that's very important so that our students who leave our universities feel good about what they're doing and see that there are many ways to have a fulfilling career in music. That's great. That's great. a great idea. Okay, I'm guessing that there are people in the audience who want to ask our panel of experts or challenge them or make comments. Who do we have? I want to follow up with Kim's question about um, we need to redefine success for our music majors. Your comment, um, how do you approach that at a school when your department is full of people that say, we just need to be better at what we do? 
which is training these professional and professional musicians? Uh, yeah, right. Um, and we've got those flexible deans too, right? Um, very good question. It's not a particular issue in my school, so I don't deal with that. Um, I think in finding someone who can sneak a course in there to start out that just reaches the few students who might be interested, and if you can get that going. Another thing that I'm working on with my own faculty um, to get them connected to some of the issues that I'm working on here is to help them start businesses. Uh, I have an MBA and I've started a couple of businesses and I've worked with other people, so I'm trying to garner their support by convincing them that they have things of value to get out and disseminate. And so I've helped uh, the oboe teacher to start a reed making company. Mm. Now she's an entrepreneur and she's all excited about it. Uh, the violin teacher has a CD that she wants to sell. So I'm working with her to figure out ways to sell her CD. The cello teacher has written some warm up routines and I'm working with him to get it published. Uh, so one of the ways I'm going at it is to reach the faculty and to help them develop something in hopes that they will, because they're going to be our best conduits sure. for these ideas. So if we can get them excited about it and not afraid of filling out a DBA, maybe they'll convince their students that wouldn't be such a bad thing too. Could I add some to that? Um, yeah, I agree. Um, well, how I work and what I work in is nothing I was trained to do. <laughs> I've been a, a professor of law, I've been a professor of business, never had a course in either of these things. I mean, you should fall into stuff. It's just a blast. Just try foolish things and fail a lot. You get way better by failing. Now, <laughs> uh, if I could just mention a few jobs. I just uh, checked, I have some job sources and friends and various things. I just got some of these from Digital Music News. Just to give you some of the names, head of content, Associate Director of Web Properties, Director of Partnership and Digital Marketing. And this one kills recording industry people. Oh, they'll throw up at these words. <laughs> LimeWire Store Product Manager. I mean, LimeWire is Satan to them, you know? Um, Amazon's MP3 Operations Coordinator. A friend of mine runs uh, Amazon's music <laughs> system, so that's the gig he's looking, for, looking to hire. Uh, Principal Product Manager, Spoken Word Audio, at Amazon. Uh, Non-legal associates for legal and business affairs at, at new companies. AOL music products director, um, director of technology development at Warner Brothers. So these are jobs that are, are right up this moment that people are looking for and they often a bachelor's degree, less, doctorate never hurts, you know. So I, I, I think it's uh, time to really look at some of these other things that are out there. And the, uh, my students, students I've, at different schools where I've been, have, you know, they're, they're this good and they do it, whether we train them or not. So I'm the outsider, I can say what I want. First thing I wrote down was change schools. Your life short, my life short. If you feel that you're being called to an activity that you can influence and you cannot do that in your current environment, every year a class goes through, that means that class has not had the benefit of your experience, your leadership, your guidance, and your judgment. Change schools. Now, I know that's impractical for all of y'all, but I'm the outsider. I can say what I want. And I just did. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> it didn't take me a second to write that down. <laughs> so other questions, comments? Intrigued by the ignorant dean thing, Paul. The, by the what? The ignorant dean. Yeah, ignorance is bliss, isn't it? Yeah. But say a little bit more. I want to understand what you're what you mean by that because it is interesting. What did I say? Well, something about <laughs> ignorance and deans. Put those two together. Whoa. <laughs> are, are they, I, so, yeah. Uh, leaders. Leaders. Ign oh. Yeah, I wasn't speaking of deans, so don't. Oh, okay. Don't, I was speaking of community leaders. And if a dean is a leader sure. in a community, fine. Um, Define the ignorance. That I'm, I'm really intrigued. Did, you said cultural ignorance. Yeah. If, if you want to have a great philosophical discussion sometime over a drink. Oh, I'd love to. Right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <that caffeine>? yeah. <laughs> Understanding, this is just through my perspective. A little bit informed, but mostly just mine. Understanding the patterns of 
the evolution of American society and some of the great and now non-existent societies of all history are fascinating. When a society becomes so fixated on the transactional and the trivial, I don't think the future is a very hopeful place. And what we do in, in, through the arts and through music education strikes me, or at least I've based my whole career on the belief that it is bigger than all of us. When that is absent in the public discourse in the leadership of companies and foundations and civic organizations, it's a really dark place. That's what I mean by combating ignorance. You are the light. I, I tell volunteers this frequently. We are, in some cases, in a student's life in our talent program, we are their last chance of, of, uh, of them doing something that they previously thought was unaccomplishable because of this little program. And, and that's really great. And maybe it'll make a difference. But that's, if I wo waved a wand, is that the past tense of waved? If I waved a wand, that would be a great thing for all of you to somehow... Um, insert into the collegiate experience so that it mattered when they left your institutions because it would make for better societies. Michael. Paul. This is a question. Yes, sir. So uh -oh. five years ago when I started looking at entrepreneurship and orchestras and what we're doing in music higher education, Yes. Um, I called up the American Symphony Orchestra League, which interestingly rebranded themselves. Yes, the League. <laughs> Of American orchestras. Yes. Really? About ten. Can't use that old abbreviation anymore. <laughs> okay. And now everything's better. They had this, this 23 full time, full year symphony orchestras in America. Yeah. When I spoke to them earlier this year, that number was down to 15. Yeah. So that has been declining. I don't know whether Atlanta Symphony falls into that category. But you go ahead. May, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been advising and emailing back and forth with members of the Columbus Symphony. Georgia, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio. Okay, good. This is my home state. Which has been at a big impasse. Yes. In a very traditional way between yes. orchestra and man yep. management, which is that management looks at musicians as being idiots of ants that don't know anything beyond their ability to play an instrument. And musicians, for their part, look at administration's sole job as raising more money so we can have higher salaries and, and longer seasons. Right. The question I'm going to pose to you after I've been obviously editorializing. That's is, good, though. Are you from Columbus? No. Okay. Um, the question I want to ask you is, if you could wave that wand, what are the kind of things that you would want your symphony orchestra music musicians to be studying in college so that when they get that job at the Atlanta Symphony, um, they would come and be proactive and drivers of what you do? Um. Exactly the things that she was talking about to me strike me as heading in the right direction. I don't. I think the days in most orchestras of merely being a great fiddle player and not being a conscientious citizen, teacher, section member, um, understanding voice of the business. I think those days are gone, where you just sit in the practice room for eight hours a day. For most high-level orchestra members. Um, what, what I would encourage you to do is to, can, is to be dedicated to building more well-rounded, top-level musicians. They understood the challenges of running a nonprofit in today's world. They understood the dynamic of the contract between a nonprofit and its community. They understood you know, generally what fundraising and arts are, are about. All of our new players have a noticeable difference didn't happen. When I was in Chicago, it is perfectly fine and probably will be for a very long time to be a great fiddle player only. Our players come here with a much broader perspective. And right now we're the fifth largest orchestra in America, so it's it, the, chi the times are changing. So what do you do to make them into a team, the whole orchestra and administration and everybody else? Is it a big team play? Um, it's... It's a very simple answer, but almost, it, it's a very simple answer. You have to build a culture of which that is the culture. I'm sure at your universities, you all have your own culture. There's a certain faculty culture, certain student culture that has either evolved or been developed. We have worked very hard over a long time, 15 years, to try to develop a culture 
where there's great interactivity, there's a culture of inclusiveness, we have a habit of always being the first to tell other parts of our organization good news or bad news. Um, when something does happen that's painful, we're the first to talk about it. We have people legitimately involved at the governance level, not in some fake way, but in a legitimate way. And I think you earn it by your actions over time and you build a culture that says music. our professional musicians are going to be at the table talking with us. They're going to have a deep understanding of our numbers as our board does. And when we do sit down for the act of negotiation, it will be done in a constructive and, you know, that's what negotiation is. But then you'll move on through the strength of the culture. I, I feel for Columbus. I used to do some work for them and it's... There are three dimensions to the Columbus scenario. The two you mentioned, plus the third that we're talking about, which is just the community of Columbus. Yeah. You know, they look across I-70 to Indianapolis and say, why can't we be Indianapolis as far as a $125 million endowment and full-time existence and all that? Because they don't have $125 million endowments. Why they can't do that? Yes, well, and I, I, I'm actually a member of that local. Hi, Paul. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Way back. <gasps> Evansville days. Yeah, we got to talk. Wow. My question, following up on, on, on uh, Michael, Mike, Mike's question is how do we, I'm an oboist, professional player, I'm an administrator now of a large music school on the West Coast, and what I like to say to parents who are bringing their kids in for their college, their fearful meeting was, what, what's my kid going to do with their life and <laughs> yeah. music, what the heck, you know, and I'm saying it, the creative the creative culture is what's going to lead us this country forward, this is very important work, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But when you take people and, and you send them out into the profession and you have an audition process, for example, for orchestras, it's blind, there's no skill set that's being evaluated <coughs> other than how a person handles a 15-minute audition. How do you develop that culture within your orchestra? Or how, how do you get players who, you attract players who have that sensibility into these fields so that at Columbus, because I'm very familiar with the players oh, yeah, in the orchestra, yeah. that dynamic. I, I, I'm in the other orchestra in Columbus that mm. survives. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's a mess. And it's self-inflicted in some respects. No, it's true. The journey to this dimension, which I'm sure seems so distant from the way you do your hiring practices at higher education, <laughs> is, is slowly changing. I don't think we'll ever get away from the talent-based first dimension of an audition. However, for our concertmaster, which we're now in a two-year journey through, after you get through to the, oh my gosh, these guys can really play the fiddle, then there's the whole, what's this person going to be as a leader dimension, which is brand new. Heretofore, it was, oh, just put the best fiddler sitting up there. We didn't care if they were mean to people, terrible leader, stupid, ugly. We still don't care if they're stupid or ugly, but, but, but now we're, we're, concerned. <laughs> we're, we're concerned about their leadership dimension. What does the original meaning of the concertmaster role uh, suggest for this position? And, and we're involved in that. And I had the same journey in Baltimore when... when um, when we had a new concertmaster, but that's going to be a slow process because of the abuses of our of our forefathers. You know, you, you come visit and we'll 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 pick out a chair together. But I think that's what's going to have to happen. Okay, I have to draw this to a close. This has been fascinating, you guys. You guys have been terrific. I need to keep us on schedule, <laughs> but I just want to point out some themes that I've been hearing throughout. Um, we've been talking about a little bit now about the culture of, of orchestras, but earlier about the cultures of our own institutions. And these issues that we've been thinking about, I think from the beginning, is about keeping your eye on the prize. What is the goal? What is your mission? What What is it you're really trying to accomplish? And the this theme of community engagement and about leadership um, keeps coming back. I think the idea of uh, flexibility and, and forward thinking um, and uh, constituency building, the advocacy that we have to do within our own institutions in order to move forward on any of these areas, um, it's, uh, it's encouraging. So I'm, you know, I'm glad. Thank you all.